everyone. Hi. I am so glad to be here again. Good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are. Um, I would like to welcome you to our number five uh, Facebook Live. And today we'll be talking about herbs in dogs, detox, liver disease, longevity. Now we'll just kind of tie lightly into the last uh, Facebook Live that I had a week ago. And I talked about how to reduce drugs um, in medicine, prescription drugs in medicine, and why. Um, I talked about um, the fact that that drugs in a way are foreign chemicals that the body has to deal with on top of the disease and they're always or should be the last resort. Now before we start I would also would like to welcome Leah, one of our team members who's been a regular now. Hi Leah. Hi Peter. And she's in Calgary. I'm in Vancouver, back in Vancouver. Um, so I'm, that's why I'm dressed a little warmer and Pax is walking somewhere out in the forest. He's lucky. But I'm lucky too because I had a lot of fun preparing this um, webinar for today. And I also would like to welcome Michelle, who is behind the scenes watching with you guys. And she's going to be posting links and answers to your questions and uh, will be helpful as always. Michelle is amazing when it comes to helping us to uh, be informed and uh, organized. So, um, as I said last time, I discussed, uh, I talked about um, drugs and that they're in a way foreign substances that are toxic and uh, ideally we should not be using them. Now, the problem is that when we have toxin substances in the body, toxic substances in the body, uh, they can create a real havoc with the biochemist biochemistry of the body. And uh, there is about 37 thousand billion billion 37,000 with 21 zeros I know I say it every single webinar of chemical reactions happening in the body every second and if there's something missing or something added to the body it obviously interferes and creates a havoc out of those chemical reactions I will be sharing screen today just because I wanted to have a little bit of learning in pictures as well um, so I'm just going to do that now and um, Leah, let me know if uh, the screen is sharing. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so this is the number of chemical reactions happening in the body every second. It is staggering. It is also beautiful because it tells you how amazing universe the universe is when it comes to its automation. I'm sure that you're not really overseeing the 37,000 billion billion chemical reactions in your dog's body every second because you would go crazy and I would go crazy and it would be really, really, really fast. But the pollution in, in the environment is real and toxins are real. And I'm not going to draw a little doom and gloom picture or scenario because I am actually an optimist and I quite often see glass half full than empty. Recently, I've been listening to an amazing, well, amazing audiobook, interesting audiobook. It's not written that great, but what it says is that our population growth is going to slow down and our pollution is going to slow down. And even though we are actually dealing with the consequences of what we've been doing for the last 50 or 100 years, it is not only doom and gloom and that nature and the universe has an ability to kind of slow things down. If a species overpopulates, it uh, naturally actually stops reproducing as much and it doesn't necessarily need to lead to pandemic or something like that. It's just a natural flow of events. Also, we've been seeing these symptoms in the Western world in Western countries where um, they have actually a really hard time to uh, maintain their population. So pollution is real and we need to really do all we can to reduce it. But while it is there, we also have to do all we can to reduce the influence of toxins on our body and on our dogs. Because the more toxic the environment is, the more likely we are to face uh, problems, disease, uh, DNA replication errors and premature aging. 
you know, I was thinking, how can I actually display toxins today? Because every every time I talk about toxins, I try to find a different perspective. And I found this picture, and I think that it is actually a good equivalent of what toxins do. Toxins basically are a disturbing element. They uh, mug the picture. They make the body struggle with deciphering what is right and what is wrong and get overwhelmed. The same way your visual senses get overwhelmed when you look at this, this graffiti. It'd be very difficult for me to shut the screen off now and you're remembering what is on it. But if I give you a nice, beautiful picture of, let's say, broccoli, you will actually remember the broccoli. Uh, not saying that broccoli is your favorite food, but you know, it just came to mind. Anyway, uh, another way to see toxins, and I mentioned that last time, is um, to see them as disturbance, some sort of unusual noise at the concert, or interference, electronic interference, or transmitter interference at a concert. This picture I took uh, at Ed Sheeran's concert last year. And I was imagining that if there were some sort of hooligans and they would actually suddenly start causing havoc and, and rocket, uh, it would be much more difficult to enjoy the music and also distinguish and see and hear the tones. So toxins are the disturbance that happens in the body uh, when they enter, uh, metabolic disturbance, similar to concert being disturbed by hooligans. Um, you know, toxins are kind of funny. They are much, much more likely to settle in the body when there are deficiencies of nutrients. Number one, when the nutrient deficiency is there, the toxins have more space to kind of harbor. Uh, toxins are funny because they thrive on uh, the, the body not, not being as effective in eliminating them. I see the deficiencies as empty parking spots in the body and the toxins then have plenty of area and space to park. If you have a body that is well nourished with uh, the essential nutrients, which we enduring and call fab four, like omegas, uh, vitamins, minerals, and probiotics, if they're, the body is nourished, then the toxins do not have as much uh, space to park in, in quotes. Um, the, the cells and the enzymatic reactions have certain spots, imagine, parking spots for the particular elements or toxins. And we know that elements uh, and toxins compete with each other. A good example is, for example, for example, calcium and lead or iron and mercury. They compete with each other, with each other and they can mimic each other in some of these reactions because they have usually and commonly the same electronic, electric charge. So, you know, the other uh, option, even though it's, it's so remote for most of us now, is an airplane uh, seating. Um, if there are, if it's almost like toxins sit in a seat that is reserved for you. And it's very difficult to push the passenger that already settled in, in that spot. Or, you know, when airlines oversell space, um, the toxins are the passengers that, uh, that um, would not get on if the flight is full of good minerals, okay? So there is a few different ways for you to imagine what toxins do. But the most important part is that they're real and that they are proven scientifically and in research causing problems, you know, starting with mercury, lead, DDT, thalamide, how do you pronounce it, that drug name? Yeah, <laughs> thalidomide, I think. That's the drug that was used and disturbed extremity um, development in fet fetuses. Um, so remember, 37,000 billion billion reactions every second. And I like to eliminate toxins by, by using nature. And nature is the most powerful pharmacy. It has, uh, it has amazing ability to um, help our bodies to eliminate toxins. And not only us, it's also other animals and obviously dogs and other animals. We, we know that, that animals are seeking certain herbs. And it's so interesting to see that when um, dogs are going through certain disease, they're prone to eating certain herbs or other animals too. I would like to start with artichoke because we are talking today, we are talking about herbs and how we use them in healing and detox and eliminating toxins. Artichoke is, um, is basically a form of thistle. Um, it is an immature flower. 
And most of the harvest is done in California, even though it does come from the Middle East. And when I was researching and doing a little bit of reading about these different herbs, when I started formulating our liver detox, I also loved looking into the mythology of uh, different herbs. And artichoke is really cool because in the Greek mythology, artichoke is actually um, a transformed goddess, believe it or not. What happened, Zeus um, visited his brother, Poseidon, and um, he met at Poseidon's palace, he met uh, a beautiful, beautiful girl called, or woman, and her name was Sinara. And he made her a goddess and took her to Olympus and, and they lived there. But Sinara really missed her family. And um, she usually snuck out from time to time to visit her family. And when Zeus saw that, that Sinara was sneaking out of the, of the, of the palace, uh, he actually got really mad and turned her into an artichoke flower and throw her, threw her out of the, the palace. So that's why artichoke in Latin is called Sinara. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of an interesting one. But when it comes to the medicinal effect and medicinal uh, function of or, or effect of um, artichoke, it is quite fascinating that it has twice as much antioxidants as blueberries. Okay, it is not blue, but it is amazingly potent when it comes to antioxidants. It can be used for nausea, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, kidney disease, um, arthritis, uh, bladder infections, all that is really, really uh, important when it comes to using artichoke as a herbal medicine. So remember that not only you can actually give artichoke to your dog in food um, cooked, uh, but you can, also, um, you can also give it in supplements and it is safe. Artichoke own, also has a lot of fiber and we know that fiber is good for bowel movement and digestive tract and uh, overall artichoke is a really, really amazing plant and herb. There are some contraindications. If you have a dog or if you are on anticoagulants or if you are on antibiotics, um, it may be a good idea to talk to your veterinarian and find out whether the antibody don't interfere with anticoagulant and uh, medication like that. Um, dandelion is the next one. And um, I do have a story about dandelion as well. But before we, I go to the story, I'll tell you that it is uh, an amazing tonic for uh, liver. It is uh, very high in inulin, which is a uh, prebiotic for probiotic bacteria. Inulin is one of the most effective prebiotics that is also used for- Peter, we're getting a little bit of background noise. Okay. Um, oh. Yeah, I'm not okay. sure what's going on where your mic okay. maybe is, if there's papers yeah. in the way. That's that's probably paper. Those are my notes here. I, I'm, I wanted to make sure that I don't forget anything. Anyway, thank you, Leah. So uh, dandelion is uh, rich in inulin and inulin is, um, is good prebiotic or food for the probiotic bacteria. Remember that it is not just enough to um, get probiotics. You also have to have the right ingredients to feed the probiotic bacteria. Blueberries are another one. I personally take blueberry um, kind of mix or frozen blueberries that I make into a thick smoothie and I eat it every morning. And it is also a good source of fiber and uh, prebiotics. So anyway, the story goes about uh, Dandelion that um, uh, Theseus, uh, which was another god uh, who was basically destined to fight uh, Minotaur, which was uh, part human and part bull. He actually ate Dandelion for 30 days prior to the fight. And um, it's, it gave him strength and it gave him the power. In medicine, we use uh, dandelion for heart disease, for when, when a dog loses appetite or a person loses appetite, for flatulence, for indigestion, for gallbladder stones uh, and stimulation of bile and, and, and secretion of bile. We also can use dandelion and dandelion root for 
muscle pain, for joint pain, for uh, as a blood tonic and uh, also skin toner. So this is actually something that 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 is very powerful, and and I love dandelion. And and the beautiful part is that dandelion is so strong and hardy, and it grows in so many climates. And quite often, climates quite often you see those herbs actually having very similar properties to what they're supposed to strengthen, right? Uh, you look at milk thistle, how, how strong and resilient it is, or dandelion and other plants. So milk thistle is the next one. And um, there is another story with milk thistle as well. Um, the, oops, I am jumping forward, too, too far forward. Anyway, um, it obviously belongs to thistles, and um, this is, is actually, thistle is um, also linked to Greek mythology, mythology, mythology or mythology. And um, it's linked to Jupiter, which in Roman mythology is actually Zeus, the Greek god, uh, and Jupiter or Zeus were, it was the omnipotent, uh, the god that looked after everything after the order in the world and make sure that everyone and everything lives in peace. And I really love that because uh, milk thistle is known to be the top herb or remedy in herbal medicine for creating order in the body, for helping the liver to detox, uh, creating order after the, the toxins enter and, and, and try to create havoc cause havoc, like the hooligans at the concert. So Zeus or Jupiter um, are connected with milk thistle. And I also really love milk thistle because it's beautiful and at the same time it's thorny and it has the strength, right? So, you know, it is, it is used for um, situations when there is toxic liver damage. So, you know, in any situation in, in today's world, milk thistle is actually a herb that, that we all should take from time to time. Uh, I'm going to talk about frequency and I'm going to talk about detox. Um, and obviously you can, you can either get the herbs or you can get a supplement that ha will have um, milk thistle in it. Um, milk thistle is good for liver cirrhosis, whether it's due to viral disease or um, too much alcohol consumption or hepatitis, um, all that is important uh, to know. Um, it's also good for colitis, digestion, diabetes. Uh, it can be also used for situation where there is cancer, like prostate cancer. So remember that milk thistle is actually an amazing herb and there are very few side effects. The, the active ingredient is uh, called silymarin and um, it also contains vitamin E. So remember, um, Milk thistle is uh, closely connected with Zeus or Jupiter, and it's, uh, it's the peacemaker. It's the, the one that instills order in the body or in the world when it came to Zeus or Jupiter. Barley grass. I love barley grass. I, when I left Maui a week ago, I realized that I forgot my barley grass there, and I didn't have any here until we accidentally found one little jar in, in the back of the fridge and I was so thrilled this morning. Um, I mix it with my blueberry mix uh, when I make my little uh, thick smoothie. And um, I love it because it's detox. It has It is very rich in, in minerals and vitamins. It's rich in chlorophyll, which is blood cleansing and liver cleansing. And I was also interested uh, when I was uh, researching barley grass, where it came from. It actually came from, the use came from um, the Middle East, and it spread all over the world from there. And it's used for thousands and thousands of years. You know, it's so cool to see that the ancient civilizations actually were quite advanced in many ways, and possibly more advanced than we are uh, when it comes to medical use of herbs and, and nature. It's, um, it's good for diarrhea, gastrointestinal problems, uh, bowel conditions, Crohn's disease, but obviously also for liver cleansing. And uh, the use goes as far back as 7,000 7, 7, years BC. So it's quite incredible, isn't it? How far it goes. Um, barley grass is also really great for lowering blood sugar and reducing body weight. If you are looking at some other ingredients for losing weight and optimizing your weight, 
um, Dr. Michael Greger, who wrote a book, um, How Not to Diet, D-I-E-T, um, is an amazing book when it comes to uh, dietary recommendations and suggestions. Now, he's taken all the dietary research available. He's a real nerd and a little hard to listen to, but lovely person, smart. He uh, basically compiled all the research and kind of debunked all the different diets from keto to paleo and all those and just kind of made it really simple. Plant-based diet with a lot of fiber, a lot of vegetables and greens and minimizing animal protein and uh, fats when, you know, saturated fats and sugars. Uh, that's basically it. A uh, really cool book, How Not to Diet. I'm sure that Michelle will probably find a link and post it for you. Um, I don't really consider myself a nerd, but now I'm thinking maybe I am because I love this kind of stuff. Turmeric is um, the next herb. And actually, it's not a herb, it's a root. And um, believe it or not, we actually grew about two buckets of turmeric in Maui. And I was so thrilled because it was so easy to grow. And we dehydrated it and we have it in powder and we brought it here and we'll be making curries and um, other foods and put it in our smoothies and food. Um, turmeric is um, a root, it's very similar to ginger. And it is part of the traditional Chinese and also Vedic medicine, Ayurvedic medicine. And Ayurveda, if you look at it as a kind of core principles of, uh, of the natural healing in India and the, the Eastern cultures, um, it is actually uh, wisdom about meaning of the life. Uh, that's what the translation says. Air is a meaning of life or life meaning and Veda is uh, science. So it's life science basically. So it's kind of cool. Um, there is some interesting stuff about turmeric besides it being incredibly good for detoxing for liver, for liver conditions, for gastrointestinal problems. It is also used um, as an anti-inflammatory for joint disease, muscle pain, muscle aches. Um, it is actually as powerful without the side effects as ibuprofen. And there is research that uh, we have on our uh, website and I'm sure Michelle will find uh, the link on liver tune um, ingredients. And um, I have had actually just, just about last week, uh, my friend, one of my friend Catherine called me from um, Quebec, letting me know that her dog who's had um, liver enzyme elevation for three months, oh, sorry, three years, has now normal liver enzymes after using the herbal formula that I uh, put turmeric in as well. So it's kind of cool. Um, turmeric is also used um, traditionally in uh, weddings, believe it or not, because it's uh, it's considered to be sacred. It's considered to be auspic auspicious and, and it is used for making um, little necklace, which is called Man Mangala Sutra. A Mangala Sutra is a necklace that the groom puts on the bride, um, and that's a sign of the bride being very highly regarded and skilled in, you know, running the household and being being um, being the being the kind of leader in the household. So I really like that too. Um, there's another really interesting effect of turmeric, and that is that it's uh, known to be. Um, uh, useful in treating of helicobacter uh, infections and stomach ulcers. If your dog has gastritis or gastric reflux or maldigestion, it can be really beneficial. Um, it should not be given in cases where uh, a person or dog is on anticoagulants, so just be careful about that, but otherwise it can be used and it's very helpful. Obviously, we all remember that turmeric or should remember that turmeric is also good for cancer prevention. And that's one of the reasons why I put it in soul food, um, our multivitamin for dogs, because beside providing vitamins, what I wanted to do is to put um, also some organ protective and preventive um, ingredients in it. So turmeric is in soul food. Um, and I'm making the noise again, I can see, I'm sure. Leah is saying, oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> pardon me. Anyway, uh, the next, um, next um, detox ingredient that I really love is broccoli sprouts. 
and broccoli sprouts are great for boosting metabolism. Metabolism. They have um, very strong enzymatic activity. Uh, they are good for uh, preventing um, anemia and prevent uh, nerve damage. Uh, improves vision because it has so uh, such high volumes of vitamins and amounts of vitamins, and it also is good for immune function. So remember, remember that broccoli. Um, sprouts are super important, and that's why I love them and, and put them in some of the formulas that um, that I make. Um, cilantro, cilantro is really cool. Cilantro um, is uh, or coriander uh, in Europe. Uh, you will not find cilantro; you will find coriander. Is used for millennia as well. Um, it has been found in some of the tombs in Egypt, um, figuring out that that most likely it was used um, there and um, used medicinally. So that's kind of cool that some of the themes contain actually herbs, medicinal herbs. Um, obviously, um, the, the ancient civilization thought that, that if they put the herbs in a theme, that, that somehow it'll help the, the spirit of the, of the deceased. So it's kind of cool. And the last herb that I'd like to talk to you about is ashwagandha. And ashwagandha is also called or perceived to be an Indian ginseng. And it is an adaptogen. An adaptogen is uh, a, a group of herbs or medicinal food that um, is uh, beneficial for um, re reducing stress and, and increasing resistance to stress. Um, it um, has been found very beneficial when it comes to detox. If you have a dog that is anxious, that is upset or even, even angry, uh, it is a very good herb uh, to use. Um, it is it has wide ranging health benefits and um, and it is used in Vedic medicine as well. Uh, when it comes to the medical conditions, uh, arthritis, anxiety, tumors, uh, hypothyroidism, and chronic liver disease are some of the conditions that it can be used for. And it's also used for patients with after chemotherapy because it's again uh, reducing the the effect of chemotherapy. So those are the, the main herbs that uh, I wanted to talk to you about. And I would like to just kind of give you a little bit of a summary. Those are the ones that we talked about today. And, uh, you know, detox is a process where basically you try to push out the toxins. And the toxins can be pushed out by two different, in two different steps. One of them is to cleanse, meaning eliminating the toxins by using the herbs but also using the beneficial uh, minerals and essential minerals because they compete with the toxins and also improve the enzymatic capacity of the body and the liver to eliminate toxins. So, so cleanse is relatively easy. It's like, you know, nature applies cleanse in so many ways, whether it's waves um, in the ocean and oxygenation or whether it rolls water over the rocks and oxygenates when the river, river flows down to the ocean. Uh, rain is a cleansing substance, enzymatic processes, bacteria, um, and obviously in animals, food and healing food. Um, the best medicine is food. I always say that. And I've seen that in my own experience. When I was um, a teenager, I suffered with allergies to the point where I could not, and hay fever, I could not breathe through the nose for six months out of the year. And every time I see someone complaining about allergies, I so would love them to, to adopt these simple steps that I've taken, which is detox, then providing the essential nutrients, reducing the, the allergens like milk and sometimes sweet and, and grains, not always, depending on how you do, and not eating processed food and, and, and uh, preserved food, chemically preserved food and processed food. And it's as simple as that. But what is really key and crucial is actually discipline. Because if we, my sister, my, my sister who lives in the Czech Republic, I love her dearly and, and she suffers with allergies. But every time I say, you know, you may want to cut back on dairy and cheese, she kind of looks at me like I took her children away. So it's, uh, it's not easy sometimes with us um, um, trying to help because people take offense. And so this is a better way to go that I just kind of put it out there and then whoever wants to take it, take it. And whoever wants to leave it, leaves it. Um, 
you may have noticed that uh, there are two products that are part of the cleansing cycle um, in our kind of uh, detox protocol. Uh, Michelle will um, Michelle will post uh, some information about the cleansing protocols and articles. Um, and there's also one more thing that I want to talk to you, and that's fermentation, because fermentation is becoming the holy grail of, um, of any supplement or herbal medicine production. And, and the reason is that it actually increases the, the content, content of polyphenols, which are antioxidants and antibacterial and antivirus effect. Um, compo compounds or components. Um, they also stimulate the immune system. Fermentation is also scientifically proven to increase GABA, which is antioxidant as well, antihypertensive and antibacterial, and has uh, anti-allergy effect as well. And it also reduces the inflammatory mediators. So, you know, when you want to reduce inflammation in your body or your dog's body, especially if you have middle-aged or senior dog, Fermented products will also help you that. So I've been, you know, fermentation is not as um, easy as putting all herbs together, mix them up in a powder, but it definitely is more effective. And I find that um, that when it comes to um, the results that I've seen, they definitely they definitely vary. Now I'm just going to I'm just seeing that I lost my mouse. Oh now I I'm back. <laughs> I'm gonna I stop sharing. Anyway, uh, I am open to questions today. Uh, if you have any questions uh, about what I just said and mentioned, uh, please ask away. And uh, I know that Leah is already going through the questions here. Yes, we've got quite a few coming in already. Um, first off, Anna is asking, can you give too much pre or probiotic? Well, you know, I think that it would be very, very hard because uh, you'd have to really feeding it by by tablespoons and cups. And I don't think that you have the budget for eating a $1,000 of probiotics and prebiotics every day or every month. So I, I don't think so. It's, you know, this is one of those situations where you cannot really cause damage. The, it, it's impossible. I've never seen it happen. And what about fiber? Catherine is asking if a dog can get too much fiber. Um, I think that the dog is a smart being and dog will probably not eat diet where there's too much fiber. I, I, I would not um, feed something like metapenicil, uh, but when you feed vegetables and grass and, uh, and greens, um, I don't think so. I don't think that your dog can get too much fiber. And he or she will regulate himself or herself too. And Catherine's follow-up question, she's asking, how long would a detox take to help a dog get back to a normal state in general? And are there any dangers of detoxing? You know, I mentioned some of the contraindications with uh, dogs on anticoagulants, or sometimes when you have a dog with uh, large gallbladder stones, it can actually try to push the gallbladder stones through the, through the ducts and it can cause problems. But Clinically, I have not really seen that. Uh, they say that that can happen, but I haven't seen it. Um, I usually do a cleanse for four weeks every two, sorry, twice a year, every six months. And Pax and I are actually just due for another detox or cleanse. So we'll be doing that together. It's always easy to do it together with your dog. Um, I do use the liver tune, which is our uh, canine certified organic uh, liver cleanse product. Um, it is made in human certified facility and basically the herbs for a human cleanse and canine cleanse are the same. It is off-label use to use it for humans, so I can't really recommend it officially, but it is made in human uh, certified organic facility. So it's the top human ingredients. Um, plus, we also test on humans. Every single product that, I, that I've made and ever formulated, I start uh, testing the ingredients first on me, then on my family and friends, and then on dogs. So we kind of reverse the testing on animal, testing on humans. Um, we are actually making uh, some progress in uh, testing some ingredients for senior dogs and mobility. It's still not ready to launch, but I'm really excited and, and hoping that it's gonna go fast. So that's something to also mention. All right, we have a lot of questions coming in, which is great to see. 
Um, Alessi is asking, I would like to try liver tune. However, will it make conditions worse before it begins to make the dog's condition better? Um, uh, you know, I have not seen that happening. I know what you mean by aggravation. Sometimes when, um, when there is, um, uh, when there is a pro healing process is actually an interesting one. Uh, when I took, um, homeopathy classes and I, I worked with homeopathy a lot over the years, uh, sometimes there is an aggravation, meaning that there can be diarrhea or eruption, skin eruptions or vomiting or something like that. We have not seen that with the herbal cleanses, especially with the fermented products, because they seem to be really gentle. Um, I did have, and this is not regarding liver tune, but I've been just testing some of the ingredients for senior mobility um, uh, products or supplements. And for about a month, I basically went through the whole scale of inflammation anywhere in the body where I ever injured. And it was really interesting because first I had my knee and then I had my shoulder and then my neck and my back. And, and it all kind of went in a really fast sequence. But now two months into uh, testing some of these ingredients, I feel great. And I, I'm actually having a hard time to believe that that's possible. So I would say even if there is small or slight aggravation, maybe step back, maybe reduce the dose by half or two thirds and start again, because really um, the body heals through the, 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 the kind of aggravatory inflammatory process sometimes that, that then goes back. You have two choices in healing. You either heal what needs to be healed by the body's mechanisms or, or biochemistry and, and healing processes, or you will suppress it by drugs and you'll pay for it later. In homeopathy, we learned that uh, when we drive um, imbalances or disease inside by the drugs, when you suppress them, it usually causes more serious problems. You know, that's why teenagers have actually skin disease and skin eruptions, and you very rarely see them in older people. Skin eruptions are considered unsightly, but they're actually quite benign when it comes to damage to the body. And when we drive them back in the body by steroids or medication, then there's usually another, another deeper problem. Uh, we actually call this kind of uh, centrifugal movement of healing in nature, Herring's Law of Cure in homeopathy. That's how, that's how it's called. Because you should see the um, more serious problems disappear and the less serious problems possibly appear for a very short time and then dissip dissipate. The same way I felt it when I went through the kind of inflammatory cascade when my intestine, my mobility um, support and supplements. All right, Muda and Taylor have a very similar question. They're asking if a normal side effect to detoxing could be a dark pink color to the skin or a more pinky color to the skin. Dark pink or more pinky, you know, I've seen the kind of like the pigmentation of skin. It almost looks like it's, you know, it's pink underneath and then there's like a little bit of black surface. I, I usually see it as a sign of the metabolism not being completely efficient and effective. I would do, I would do detox. I would provide the Fabulous Four or any other essentials that you use. I would, um, figure out, try to figure out whether there's any heavy metals or toxins by running hair tests. Those are sort of the three main kind of steps that I would take. Um, uh, pinkish skin can be for some time, but if it lasts more than a week or two, I would say that it's probably something that is not really resolving. Uh, sometimes pinkish skin can be a result of um, uh, inflammation on the skin. Um, and underlying muscles. Sometimes dogs chew or lick and they can create irritation. I'd have to see more, um, more I'd have to see pictures. I'd have to know more about, uh, about this condition. But when it comes to blackening, I sometimes see it in dogs on corticosteroids or dogs that would have adrenal stress or adrenal hormone elevation. Uh, or if, there, if there's medication applied to the skin in that area, that's, that's common too. And Melina is asking, what kind of water is the best for dogs to drink? Such a cool question. You know, I, I was actually planning to talk about water uh, when I started today. And then for some reason, I forgot. Um, I like filtered water that does not have chlorine. 
I do not like reverse osmosis, which is basically demineralize and then remineralize water because it it is not as balanced. And I notice when I when I have uh, when I drink reverse osmosis water that I actually drink more and I I pee more, which is a sign that there is actually probably lack of electrolytes in the water. Definitely not distilled water, which in medicine, in when I went to vet school, was considered toxic. And I sometimes see articles and references to distilled water being used for cleansing and for health benefits. Definitely not a good idea because it's hypotonic, meaning that if you drink it, it has no minerals and it will virtually suck the minerals out of the body to kind of to increase the osmotic balance. So it's considered to be toxic. If you drink only um, uh, distilled water, you can actually die. Or if you give your dog distilled water after some time, you will you will deteriorate and you will have severe severe side effects. Both Jamie and Veronica are asking about milk thistle and asking if it's okay to use all the time or a low dose all the time. Um, I can only tell you how I feel about it. I, I think that um, even nature's pharmacy can be used, can must be used carefully and wisely. I like to keep the medicinal herbs to as medicine. Let's say once every six months cleanse, perfect. But using it on a going basis is um, not recommended unless your dog has liver disease or some sort of other conditions that indicate it. I would have certain I would have certain patients on uh, liver support for their lifetime for years, and I would not see any obvious side effects. But I do like to keep the herbs for the herbal situation, for the medical situations, or some sort of medicinal effect like the cleanse once in a while. But as I said, if you do have a dog that has liver disease, you basically give it until the liver enzymes are back to normal. And, and, and there are some situations when they will not go back to normal completely. It's okay to give um, um, the herbs, including milk, this on an ongoing basis. All right, Veronica was also asking about the ingredients um, in the Fab Four products that are those enough um, to give our dogs or could we be adding more into the daily, daily <laughs> regimen as well? You know, um, I was just thinking about it today when I was, when my mind went back to the mobility support and senior support and um, adaptogens and all we could actually use. And I, I, I say this much, if you, if you, if you have a healthy dog, and if you have a dog that is young or middle-aged, I think that the Fab Four are enough, and that's what I've been giving, that's what I've been taking. I do think that when it comes to senior dogs, we're kind of moving in the area of um, anti-aging research, not only in humans, but also in dogs, inflammation, mobility, joints, and that's something that we do need to address. Um, and I'm planning to address it. I'm really hopeful that there's going to be some real profound shift in how we address these. But I can't really give you more information because it's not solid yet. So I, I, I can only tell you that, and I'm sure that Leah probably can tell you a little bit how much I've been excited about some of the results. Uh, so to answer your question, Mobility support or anti-aging support for older dogs will be indicated. And if there is, let's say, kidney disease, glandular supplements, or if there are other medical conditions, uh, see them more as medicinal versus the Fab Four being the essentials that are nutritional. Um, if our dogs lived in the savanna in Africa in a perfectly harmonized and balanced environment, they probably would not need to get any supplements. But because our food, including meat and, and, and uh, vegetables, is produced on depleted soils, I'm seeing the deficiencies taking, um, taking toll on our body and our dog's body. And the, the best kind of compliment I can ever get is when people send us testimonials about their dogs, but also the fact that uh, pretty much my whole family and many of my friends are taking Fabulous Four for dogs. And it is not easy to convince your family to take anything. And they kind of did it on their own because they started to see the difference. So it's, you know, it's fun. It's fun. I, I know that I could be just kind of talking about the 
negativity in pet food industry or kibble or how damaging drugs are. But if I don't give you tools, if I don't give you tools that I'm actually willing to take or give my dog, then I think I'm doing only half job. So that's why I've been, I've become a passionate formulator and, uh, and really kind of take it to the next level. It's, it's really like creating a really fun recipe that, that makes a difference. Um, yeah, but you know, I, I don't like to blow my own horn. You go and, and read the testimonials, reviews, and, and maybe try it um, if you wish. But you know, it's 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 one of the hard parts for me to go to. I think it's a disservice if I don't say what I've experienced with, with some of the supplements, but I also have am having a hard time to kind of like, you know, just go and be pushy about it. So I try that try to kind of give you the information and tell you the why it's more likely than just kind of say, you have to take this or you have to give this to your dog. And yes, that passion definitely comes through, Peter, and I can definitely tell the community of just how much excitement there, there has been um, on some of the uh, results that Peter is seeing with what he's formulating right now. So <laughs> stay tuned in the community and we'll have more as soon as we can, uh, can share it. Annoyingly excited, I would say sometimes. <laughs> Don't shut up. <laughs> um, a follow-up question about the water. Um, Shawnee is asking, is boiled water considered distilled water? Boiled water is not considered distilled water because the minerals actually, you know, try to evaporate salty water, right? The minerals will stay in the pot. So it's not distilled water, but it will actually eliminate chlorine. So if you don't have, um, if you don't have filter, in your water system or if you travel, it is actually a good idea to boil the kettle, let the water cool, and then give it to your dog, then giving it chlorinated water. Most people actually don't think of chlorinated water as big of a problem as it is because it actually destroys your microflora, intestinal flora. It destroys the pathogenic bacteria, but it also destroys the, the good bacteria. It totally disrupts the, the, the gut. Melina is asking, what about fasting as a method for detoxing? Fasting, awesome, awesome, awesome uh, question. Again, I should add it to my, my talk today and thank you. Um, detox is actually, uh, sorry, fasting is actually very beneficial. I'm a big proponent of feeding dogs once a day as opposed to twice a day. I'm a big proponent of humans um, fasting, whether it's intermittent fasting, where you reduce the, the number of hours you eat during the day, or you fast once a week uh, or several days a month. I, uh, it definitely does help, but when you fast um, and the body activates uh, some of the enzymatic pathways, it is good to provide the nutrients, the essential nutrients to kind of fill in for the detox parking spots, if it makes sense, from what I said today. Um, I do intermittent fasting. I have, I started fairly recently, about two months ago, um, on the basis of reading one book, uh, which is called Life, Lifespan by um, Dr. Spencer. No, sorry, Sinclair, David Sinclair, not Spencer, David Sinclair. And he's a Harvard scientist and uh, he promotes intermittent fasting. What I noticed is that um, it makes me super, super hungry, but my body's kind of like, I feel much better. I feel less burdened by the digestion. I know that fasting does activate sirtuins, which are uh, anti-aging enzymes, uh, DNA repair enzymes. So all that is beneficial. If you do feed your dog twice a day, three times a day, try to skip one meal in the morning, try to make it smaller, smaller until it disappears. Your dog is not gonna die. And I tell you honestly, um, you get used to it. Uh, I don't get hungry until around 10 or 11. And my team knows now that I actually usually have breakfast and meetings, <laughs> but you know, I get super hungry then. But it, it is, it is, I really like it. I really do like it. And scientifically, it's it's not just my claim, but research proves that it's uh, it's actually beneficial. Yeah, I know I've I sure saw a difference in Maggie after uh, changing her from two meals a day to the one meal a day has been. She has a lot more energy for sure. 
it's hard for us, right? There's the, there's the emotional connection that we have with food and maybe we all have Italian or Jewish genes or something like that. You know? Feed, feed, eat, eat, check genes too. Oh my God. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's definitely beneficial. Uh, we also have a term for people who are incapable of not feeding and not fasting their dogs. We call it monkey love. Because, you know, monkey love is a term that was invented by my father. When we were kids, our grandma would substitute vegetables with candies if we didn't eat because she actually thought it was good for us. <laughs> so we, my, when my father discovered it, he, he had a conversation with my grandma and, and, and said that, that love like that is monkey love. It's not good for us. And, and so the love that is not good for us is actually monkey love. So be careful of monkey love because it comes in many different forms and it comes in the family. Usually when I see an overweight dog, uh, I know that if it's not the guardian, it may be the grandpa or grandma or the uncle or the neighbor who are feeding the dog, right? So it's just, uh, there's always someone sneaking something in. Yeah, a follow-up question on the fasting. Um, how should it be done for dogs? Like, is it the same for young dogs, senior dogs, any age? Uh, very good question. I would not be fasting dogs before one year of age or not feeding once a day. I usually start feeding packs. is actually in the transitional period where we just started giving him um, only small amounts of food. So until one year, I usually I recommend feeding three meals until five or six months of age, and then two meals until one year and then one meal. And if you wish, if you want to take it one step further, you can actually skip one day feeding. Dogs are able to fast for seven days easily. It's not a problem. And again, it is proven to be supporting longevity uh, when we fast. And that's what we want with our dogs. That's why we're sitting here. That's why we're learning. And do you have a preference of the time of day for that one meal? Definitely not before exercise. So that kind of speaks more for the evening. Early evening is probably preferable. If your dog is um, a hot dog, uh, meaning easily overheats, then I would recommend feeding right after the afternoon walk, but not too late because um, then dogs usually, if they fed too late and they overheat, they usually pant around one to three o'clock a.m., which is sign of toxicity, sign of liver overburden. I know that if you have a dog like that and you start using the, some of the medicinal herbs in a supplement or in food, that your dog should do better. But food, um, I, I say, huh, if you, you can either feed after the morning dog walk, if you give your dog at least three hour break uh, before the next exercise, because we don't want to take a chance that there's gonna be stomach bloat or, or the stomach will twist because it's full and your dog will start jumping and running outside. There is a slight tendency to bloat. But when it comes to bloats, um, touch wood, I have not seen them in dogs with um, on raw or homemade diet. Uh, it's a kibble disease, a kibble disease because um, dogs that eat kibble, they have very weak stomachs because those stomachs don't need to grind and digest bones and meat, right? So they, they're they very, the muscular layer is very weak and that's how, that's how bloat happens. At least that's what I think because I, 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 I haven't seen it in, in practice in dogs for, on raw food. You know, I, I, I listened to an audiobook yesterday and um, it's actually a, 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 medicinal, a medically unrelated book, but the person said, you know, I don't, uh, I, I don't do as much clinical research, I do practical research. I, I source information from my practice of 30 years. And I think this is so beautiful because when it comes to when you start seeing something work, um, I think that we discount, we, we, over, we overestimate uh, double-blinded studies that are withdrawn from reality and underestimate clinical practice and experience, which in the past, especially in the ancient medicine and traditional medicine is very valid. And I've seen that over and over that it would be very difficult to sometimes run double-blinded studies. And if I see that something works really well, beautifully well, why would I actually waste time to actually do clinical study when I already see, for example, that raw food is so much better for dogs than, than kibble and that no doctors actually in human medicine recommend processed food. 
and veterinary medicine still recommends processed food, it makes zero sense. I don't really need to do double-blinded study and sp spend two years of my, my valuable life or someone else's life to do these studies, right? And waste paper and computer power and, and resources. We should move beyond these nonsetic, nonsensical needs to confirm something that is self-evident and makes complete sense. That is absolutely so true. Um, we've got one more minute till we're at top of the hour. So I've got one last question that we'll ask yes. and we'll make sure we get Michelle and the team on all the other questions that, come, that have come in. We've had a lot of engagement and a lot of good questions. Um, this last one is about dandelion and they are asking if, it's Denise asking if dandelion is also good for kidney disease, not just liver and detox. It, it is, it is. And also asparagus is good for kidney disease. Absolutely. You know, the indications like I, 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 I kind of avoided to um, list all the medicinal effects of the different herbs, but what you can do, you can actually go to liver tune and uh, the ingredients list and the medicinal effect is there and also contraindications if you're wondering and worried about that. Uh, the contraindication list is very small. Um, we have had really good results. Uh, you know, when you look at drugs and, and see the side effects and you see herbs and see the lack of side effects, um, it's really fantastic. At the same time, <laughs> I get kind of frustrated because uh, there's so many drugs in the market that are allowed. And then there are so many obstacles put in front of herbal medicines um, or uh, some sort of plant-based uh, healing. Uh, one of the examples is not actually liver, liver um, tune because that's, uh, that, that we haven't had a problem with that to, to have it approved as a veterinary health product, but uh, our flea hex, uh, flea product, natural flea products, uh, we cannot use it in Canada because it does have, um, it does have, <laughs> now I have a complete blank, <laughs> the main ingredient. <laughs> it's yeah the approval for flea hex is because uh, they're considering it Michelle, a pest Michelle, please help me help me help me um <laughs> there, yeah then it's i think you're thinking of the neem oil neem oil yes yeah. yes i'm sorry uh that's so funny anyway um yeah so neem oil is not approved as a as an ingredient in canada that's why we cannot sell a flea product that has not had any fatalities or any reportable side effects and uh, flea products that are sold on the market all killed some dogs right so you can see that 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 it's sometimes more about um, lobbyists and how the laws are created and we know that we would have to spend about two hundred thousand dollars with no guarantees on the flea product being approved or not and we are a small company so we cannot really do it in canada but it frustrates the hell out of me sometimes to see how broken the system is and how uh, how you know how weird it is. Um, we just have to we just have to get around it and 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 try to try to vote for the politicians who actually will not be as susceptible to lobbying by drug companies and other dark forces. <laughs> drug companies are not always dark, of course. They 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 have a place in our life. I don't want to make it sound like they do, but we know that they're not always acting for the best benefit of the patient and they're more likely to act or act on behalf of the shareholders and their value and, and their stock and all that. So the world is not all positive uh, as we know, but I try to see it as, as hopeful. Anyway, thank you so much, Alia, for helping to uh, with the questions. And Michelle, thank you so much for posting the links. And thank you everyone for joining us. We'll be here again next Thursday at one o'clock Pacific, uh, four o'clock Eastern. And uh, I still don't know what the topic will be, so it'll be a surprise. But keep, uh, keep an eye on our Facebook and Instagram. And please um, try to uh, uh, follow us on Instagram because we are almost close to 10,000 people and we'd like, to, we'd like to share some links and we won't be able to do that if we don't have 10,000. And on Facebook, we are doing much better. So I think that that's, uh, that's going fairly well. And we are now present on Pinterest, uh, which has some other information. And obviously a newsletter, it is, it is the insider news and knowledge about what's going on and uh, 
I'd love you to join if you can. Thank you so much and have a wonderful evening or afternoon. Bye-bye.